This nugget is focused on the most important artifact in Scrum, which is the product backlog. But before we can talk about the product backlog, I believe we need to spend a couple of minutes talking about the product vision. As we discussed in the introductory nugget, the product vision is really not part of Scrum, but because the vision feeds the backlog, the vision is what the project is taken on to complete, I think it's important that we spend just a couple of minutes talking about the product vision. We've already spent a significant amount of time talking about the product backlog in the nugget where we discuss the overall artifacts for Scrum. We're going to talk a little bit more detail about what the product backlog really is, and we'll talk about the activities that we do against the product backlog. The most important activity is the grooming, where we will continually to review and refine all of the stories in the product backlog until we get them sprint ready. We'll discuss in a little more detail this concept of non-business stories. A lot of new people to Scrum think that the product backlog is pure business stories and get concerned that if the only thing in the product backlog is the business stories, how do I do all of the other thing that's required to make IT software success? How do I do all the other things that's required to complete the work that's not directly related to the business stories? Well, we get around that by saying we will also have as many non-business stories as necessary to ensure all of the other work that is needed gets done. And then we'll close off this nugget talking about prioritization. How do we do the most important things first? And finally, how do we select those more most important things and get them included in the sprint backlog and developed in the next sprint? But first, the product vision. And why do I say the product vision is not truly Scrum? Because all projects have a vision. The vision may not be well articulated. The vision may be only in the business owner's head. But everything we do in business, every project we take on in business, is related to a vision that our business owner has. So that's when I say it's not truly Scrum because there's nothing unique or special about having a product vision that's necessary, critical to, different, unique, special part of Scrum because all projects have to have a vision because otherwise there wouldn't be the need and we wouldn't have the commitment from the business owner to complete the work. But having said it's not truly Scrum, I will say it's absolutely critical to Scrum and I would believe probably a little more critical to Scrum to have a well-articulated vision than it may be for other projects. And the reason I believe that the product vision is so critical to Scrum is our last bullet down here is the team has to understand, the team has to buy into, and the team has to ensure every action supports the vision. So as the team is working on every story and as the team is trying to do just enough work but only enough work to support the story, the only way the team can ensure that they're doing just enough work but only enough work to support the story is if the team truly supports, understands, buys in, and is fully in tune with the vision. Because otherwise the team is going to say, well, I'm not really sure if this is enough or not, so I think I'll do a little bit more. Or the team is, I'm not really sure I truly understand, so I'll just go ahead and do some work and we'll probably find it later, but I'm sure my work is going to have some value later on, etc., etc. That all of those concepts I just described are not Scrum concepts. We do not develop work for future considerations. We do not do something because we think it will have future value. In Scrum, we do all of the work and only the work 
that's directly related to satisfying each and every story and we need to ensure that each and every story truly supports at 100% the vision and only the vision. With that said, let's step back up and discuss a little bit more about the product vision. The business owner owns the vision, the business owner often creates the vision, and the business owner, even if the business owner does not directly create, the business owner will participate in in the writing of the vision. And as we discussed in the introductory nugget, what is a vision? It is the same as a, a business vision. It is a clear, concise, well-articulated, understandable statement and I will put S statements of what it is ideally the business vision can be printed in a very large font on a single piece of paper and posted in the team workspace or better still the product vision is going to be printed in an extremely large font on a single piece of paper and handed to every single team member so they can post it in their immediate workspace. That's the critical part to getting the team understanding. As I said, the business owner owns this and either will directly create it or participate in the creation of it. And the product owner is the person who's going to be responsible for delivering the product vision. The product owner is going to take the product vision and he's going to develop the product backlog. And just like the team is responsible for ensuring they only do the minimum work required to support the story in support of the vision, the product owner is totally responsible for ensuring that only stories are accepted into the product backlog that 100% support the product vision. So enough of the vision. It's what we are working towards. It's the reason the business started the project. Let's move forward now and talk about the true scrum artifact, which is the product backlog. So I don't think I need to spend a lot of time truly describing what the product backlog is. We described it in great detail in the nugget on the scrum artifacts. So we know that the product backlog is a very visible representation of all of the stories that need to be completed to satisfy the product vision. We've said this already, but I'm going to stress it. It is the most important artifact in Scrum. There are some authors who will say really, truly, the most important artifact is the final product that the Scrum delivers, and I will agree with that, but I believe that is an end state as opposed to an internal artifact. So I will stick very much with the statement that the product backlog is the most important artifact in Scrum because it defines the project. Now, key differentiation between a product backlog defining the project and a traditional analysis document. In traditional development, the team goes away and spends two to three months coming up with a, a, an extensive, voluminous documentation of everything that's required to satisfy the product vision and the traditional analysis document after the two to three months work does define the project. The product backlog is not that. The product backlog is evolutionary and it's dynamic. It's going to start with, I'm going to say, a handful of stories. Well, team, it's time to get started. Here are some of the most important user stories that I can think of. And the product owner will probably spend a little bit of time before truly engaging the team 
digesting and understanding the business, talking to business owners and business SMEs, and starting to develop the product backlog. But the backlog is going to start with a handful of stories. It's not going to be 100%. It's evolutionary and it's dynamic. So the team will start on the backlog and it's going to have a small number of stories and then it's going to grow. And it's going to grow. And it's going to grow. As the product owner evolves, fleshes out, puts more information into the product backlog, as the grooming activities, which we're going to talk about in just a moment, continue to take the larger stories, the epics, and break them down into smaller, more manageable, more doable, more realistic scrum stories. And it's going to be evolutionary and dynamic. It's going to grow. It's going to shrink. We're going to add stories. We're going to move stories. We're going to complete stories and so on. And that's the big difference between a scrum backlog in that it starts small and grows evolutionary over the life of the project. Unlike the traditional project where we start with the big bang, we spend two to three months and we come up with a requirements document that is out of date before we even get started. Because it's evolutionary dynamic, it's always current. It always reflects the current needs. Now, a couple of rules associated to the product backlog. And the main rule is the product is the, sorry, the product owner is the only person that can remove items from the product backlog. A business SME, the business owner, one of the team members, senior executive of the organization has no right to come to the product backlog and say, I don't agree with that story, I'm taking it off. The product owner is the only person who can remove items from the backlog. If a Scrum team member sees anyone but the product owner removing stories from the product backlog, they should walk over and as politely as they can say, I really don't think you should be removing that story until you talk to the product owner. How about I get a little yellow sticky piece of paper and we'll put a note on this story that says, senior executive wonders that this is an appropriate story. Could we discuss removing it? The product owner is 100% responsible for the product backlog, which leads to our next statement. The product owner is the only person who accepts the items onto the product backlog. Anyone can add a story to the backlog. The business owner, a SME, anyone in the organization, and specifically anyone on the project team has the right to add a story to the backlog. And I say specifically the team because the team was going to add those non-business stories. But the product owner has the right to accept, to say, yes, I agree, this technology debt story is relevant and I'd like to work on it. The product owner has the right to go to the business me and say, yes, you're absolutely right. I'm glad you added that story. I will continue it and accept it into my backlog. But the product owner, again, owns the product backlog and no one else really truly has the right to remove and ads are only ads or recommended ads that must be again agreed to by the product owner. And I'm reintroducing the same product backlog whiteboard that we discussed in the artifacts. I recommend that the product backlog is a cork board that the product backlog is divided into a number of meaningful segments because the ability to manage the backlog to go into our next discussion point, which is grooming, is really critical to how well organized the product backlog is. If the product backlog is truly just a single cork board, albeit a large single cork board, a single cork board with no divisions and there are 35 to 40 stories on it, it's going to be very difficult for the product owner or the team or anyone else to look at the product backlog and make sense out of it. So again, I, I strongly recommend that your product backlog should have some degree of, of organization. 
And this is a particular organization that I find most valuable. And as we discussed grooming, you're going to very quickly see how things are going to move from category to category as the product owner goes through his grooming activities. So backlog grooming, primarily the product owner's responsibility. May bring in SMEs, may ask for the team support, but grooming the product backlog is the responsibility of the product owner because the product owner is the person who owns that backlog, is the only person with the ability to remove, and really has the only has the ability to do the approval of new additions. So what happens in grooming? A lot of different things happen in grooming. Probably the most particular thing that's going to happen to every story in the grooming process is the adding of detail. When a story is first created, the story is typically very skeletal, may contain a name of story only, i.e. a placeholder. But that's fine. We take that skeletal story, we put it on our cork board and say, here are new stories. Here are stories that need some work. Here's some stories that are valid for the product itself, but certainly aren't sprint ready. So what happens when we add the detail? We will flesh out the story. We'll take that skeletal story where it's only the name and we'll start to provide the details. As a type of user, I need to do something so that I contribute value, so that value is added to the process. We will flesh out and ensure that all of the details related to the story are eventually contained on each of the story card. And another key activity of adding detail is the definition of done. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on definition of done now because our next nugget is going to focus on what this definition of done really is. But there is always activity to be done on stories as part of grooming to add the detail. And again, the product owner is responsible for adding the detail, but often will need to bring in a SME to get the sufficient detail to take the story to the point that it's sprint ready. Another important activity of grooming is identifying the business value. Why should we do this story? So the most well-written story with all of the, as a type of user, I need to perform an activity so that a good result is completed. A very well-written story, but what's the value? Should this story be included in the product backlog? Does it truly add value? Does it warrant doing development activities? Or is this one of those very unique one-offs only happens on a, a, a fifth Sunday of a month that happens to be the same month that has a blue moon and has and has and has. There may be the very best written story in the world, but there may not be true business value in that story. So again, as the product owner goes through the grooming process, he or she will determine the business value and either again agree to keep it in the sprint and begin to set priority to it. Probably directly related to this concept of adding value is, or adding detail, is the concept of breaking stories down. If the skeletal story had nothing more than the name of the story, I need to ship product to a customer. Well, that's a placeholder, that's a story. Well, actually, that truly is an epic, as we've discussed already. Therefore, our product owner needs to spend some time identifying the stories that are in the need some work and begin to take those epics and say, here is the epic of ship product. I'm going to break that into select customer, determine inventory, select inventory, 
and so on and so on and so on. So I'm going to take my epic and create multiple stories. And then the epic will eventually be taken off the product backlog and ripped up and thrown in the, in the garbage can once the product owner believes that he or she has created all of the stories related to the epic. And probably again at this point in time, the stories are no more than the skeletal stories with the name of the story on them, waiting for another session of grooming to break them down in, into more detail. As the business owner, or sorry, or as the product owner does the next round of grooming, often a story that originally was thought, okay, I took my epic and I broke it down into all of these stories. It's just as likely that this story may need to get broken down into three more stories. And so on and so on. So epics will break down into stories. It's not uncommon for stories to break down into stories. And again, as we do that, typically they're skeletal. We'll add more detail. We'll evolve them. We'll flesh out the story. We'll add the definition of done. We'll add the business value until we believe the stories are sprint ready. And the last activity that the product owner is going to do as part of grooming is the removing of stories. Why will stories get removed? Well, a story gets removed because it was entered as an epic and the epic was broken down into stories. Valid reason for removal. A story will get removed because this used to be a valid story when the product required an X or when the government legislation reporting required an X but the business needs have changed, the government regulations have changed, therefore this story is simply no longer required. The story will be removed if we determine that there's the, no business value in completing the story and so on and so on and so on. So again, part of the grooming process is the removing of the stories. A lot of work. This is a lot of work. for the product owner and the product owner needs to be prepared to spend considerable time to do the grooming. But the product owner also needs to recognize that grooming is not a one-time activity. The product owner can't book their calendar off and says for the next five days I'm going to groom the backlog and I'm going to whip that backlog into 100% shape and I'm going to have every story in that backlog moved over to the sprint ready column. Because if the product owner takes that attitude to grooming, I'm going to do a full 100% sweep of grooming. We're really not being scrum. We're following traditional approaches because we're trying to define all of the requirements at 100% detail at one time and that's not Scrum. So it's a lot of work, requires a lot of time, but needs to happen over time. And I don't mean after 5 p.m. I mean it has to happen over the entire life of the Scrum engagement. We need to keep two to three sprints only of sprint ready stories in the backlog and the rest of the stories in the backlog should truly not be in the sprint ready. They should be in the needs more work, needs prioritization, needs to get prepared. And the reason we want to keep only two to three stories in the or two to three sprints worth of stories in the sprint ready is we don't want to do work on a story that's going to get removed because the business requirements have changed or the reporting requirements have changed or so on and so on and so on. So. Product owner's key responsibility is grooming. As we said again in introductory nugget, it's the scrum master's responsibility to keep his or her eye on the product backlog to make sure that we have those two to three sprints worth of sprint ready stories on hand, but it is the product owner's responsibility to do that grooming. And that grooming all takes place here again at the product backlog story. The focus is on two to three sprints Ready? Only. The focus is on taking the epics, taking them off, and breaking them up and making them into multiple stories. The, the focus is on taking this business story and adding detail. 
and moving it over to the sprint ready. The focus is on taking those other stories and making sure they're sprint ready and where appropriate moving them over. Taking the training stories and moving them over. Taking the non-business stories, making sure the team has all the details. Negotiating with the team whether this is the appropriate time to eliminate the technology debt and moving it over to the sprint ready. Grooming is the continual working with standing in front of this very visible product backlog and keeping it two to three sprints worth of sprint ready stories in hand at all times. And we really have already covered the significant component of these non-business stories, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this particular aspect. But again, I want to focus on the fact that these non-business stories are critical to ensure there's time to do this stuff. How's that for a technical term? Thinking back to the discussion we had for sprint planning and the development of the sprint backlog, and we'll talk about this in more detail in, in future nuggets, we select the stories from the sprint ready column or the product owner selects the stories from the sprint ready column. The project team reviews the story, says yes, they're all sprint ready, and yes, we have capacity to complete those six stories in the sprint. And if the capacity of the team is only those six stories, that's all the work that's gonna get done. And if you continue to repeat that process, that the only thing that goes into the sprint backlog are business stories, and each sprint is 100% full, there's never time to do these non-business stories. So the most common method of ensuring that these non-business stories, these housekeeping items take place, is we simply turn them into stories and we force, we insist, we cajole, we beat up the product owner and insist that these non-business stories always or also make it over into the sprint ready stories and that these non-business stories are selected for sprints at the appropriate time. And these non-business stories are anything and everything. They're technology debt. It's fixing that inefficient search process that we put in to satisfy the completion of a sprint. It's knowing that we wrote some, some bad code, that we didn't properly refactor our code, that we didn't follow other agile principles that we'll discover and discuss again in a future nugget, is going back and again doing all those fixes to keep our code 100% appropriate. Or maybe in a previous sprint, we found some bugs, very low level, very minor defects, not mission critical, but they're just things we want to fix. Or as we've discussed already, there's project team requirements. We need a new build server. We need time to send two of our junior members off to get some Java training. We need to do anything and everything that's gonna make the project team work better. We write them up as stories. We work with the product owner to get them included in the sprint. And that's how we ensure there's time to do all of this stuff. Same thing goes for documentation. These are more business focused. So it's probably a little less difficult to get the product owner to accept the fact that there's going to be stories to create documentation and that there's stories required to do training. But again, assuming the team is the people writing the documentation, assuming the team are the people doing the training, there again, these need to be created as stories taken over to that far left hand column so that they're selected for sprints and therefore they're included in our sprint work that we have to do. Similar as we have enough sprints under our belt that we're getting ready for an implementation, we will need to add stories to do implementation preparation and probably sufficient stories to cover all of the implementation activities. So these non-business stories are literally anything and everything that's required to ensure there's time in the team schedule to do all of this non-business stuff. And this is my personal recommendation of the best way to deal with non-business stories is to write them as stories and get them included in the sprint backlog. There is one other method 
that some scrum proponents suggest is there's so much heartache, there's so much pain, there's so much grief associated with getting the product owner to accept all of these stories that the pain, the grief, the, the cajoling, the forcing, the, the bl blackening of the eye required to get the product owner to support and accept these and, and include them into the sprint, that there is another approach that simply says, when you do your sprint capacity, never, never plan a sprint at full capacity. So if the team's ability in any one sprint has be de been determined to be 12 stories or 12 story points, as we select stories into the sprint, we will put a cap of nine stories points per sprint, giving us a slack of three story points and in those three story points, our spare time, the team will select and do the work on these team stories based on the team's requirements. So that is an alternative approach, is minimize, understate the sprint capacity and find the time to do this work. And I'm gonna say bury it, make it invisible from the product owner. And that's the personal reason why I don't like that approach. I don't believe we should be hiding anything from the product owner. We want full transparency within our sprint process. And the only way we're gonna have full transparency is to explicitly tell the product owner what we need to do and get the product owner to buy in. So again, two ways, both equally scrum, create the business stories and work with the product owner to get them included into a sprint or minimize your sprint capacity and ensure there's adequate time for non-business stories within each sprint. Find the method that works best for you, find the method that works best for your product owner, and then stick with it. And prioritization is really part of grooming because we're going to order the stories. But I excluded it from the general discussion on grooming because when we're prioritization, we're doing it only on the left column. Only on the sprint ready stories. And we're prioritizing the sprint ready stories to ensure that we do the most important ones in the next sprint. As plain as simple as that. So how do we make sure we do the most important stories in the next sprint? Number one is business need. Selecting the stories that's gonna give the maximum benefit to the business. If I implemented this story tomorrow, the business will get more value from this story than any other single story on the sprint ready backlog absolutely the main focus we need for prioritization. But there's a few others we need to consider. And I would say the second, and it's a very small number two, second focus of prioritization is the team need. We have technology debt. We need a new build server. Or any of the other team stories that are out on the right-hand column of the backlog that we finally got the, the product owner to move over to the sprint ready, the team is going to have some stories and the team needs to have the ability to influence, to cajole, to beat up the product owner and get the team stories included into the next sprint or at least taken to the top of the prioritization pile so that you're going to get it in the next sprint or two probably directly related to business need and probably does not need to be explicitly called out, the organization may have some needs 
for specific stories, i.e., if we don't get this story completed, we're going to fail uh, an internal audit, or if we don't get the story completed, we're not going to satisfy government legislative reporting. Probably should be reflected in the business need by default, but I thought it was worth mentioning that there may be some other priorities, some other considerations that we need to consider as we're putting our prioritization together. And then lastly, more a logical progress, there may be some absolutely critical number one business needs, but we can't do that number one business need unless the database schema is updated. And this is a separate story. So therefore, there may be a technical prerequisite that we can't satisfy a business need without a technical prerequisite in place, in which case this will very quickly rise to the top of the priority pile in support of the number one business need, or there may be some simple logical progression. We have two stories that are priority number one and two, and we have another story that's priority number 15. But the code, the, the access to the work required to satisfy priority number one and number two is so directly related to priority 15 that it just makes common sense to bump number 15 up and say, yes, we'll include number 15 in the same sprint simply to allow our development team to open and close the same common piece of code once and get all three of these stories completed. Prioritization, really part of grooming, focused on the sprint ready stories and there to make sure that when we do our sprint planning part one, we're selecting the most important stories for the sprint. We don't want to be taking time in that very focused sprint planning meeting to be doing the prioritization. Prioritization should all be done well in advance of our sprint planning meeting. And finally, I'm going to touch very quickly on the selection for the sprint. We have our backlog. We have our sprint ready stories and we have them prioritized. Probably the most important ones are at the top of the column. So when we're selecting from the sprint, we simply select the stories that have the highest priority, keeping in mind our sprint capacity that we cannot select more stories than we can complete in a two week sprint. And we'll talk more about sprint capacity and estimating and validating story complexity in a future nugget. But I thought we should discuss this final aspect for backlog maintenance because the last step is the selection and that's based purely on prioritization and selecting the appropriate number of stories that we can fit into the sprint. Recognizing that if stories priority one through six resulted in 14 story points, and we only have a capacity of 12 story points, we would have to drop number six because it had a, a request of four story points. And we would pick story number seven and story number eight, which had one story points each to allow us to move within our capacity for the sprint of 12 only. This now goes focused on a prerequisite to Scrum which is developing the product vision, what it is the business owner wants. And our main focus was on the product backlog, which is all of the stories required to satisfy the business owner's product vision. And the product backlog is just that. It's all of the stories. It's evolutionary. It's dynamic significant aspect to the evolutionary and dynamic is that we're constantly grooming our product backlog. We're adding, we're refining, we're adding detail, and we're removing stories from the product backlog to ensure it's always relevant, always fresh, and always reflects current business need. 
And that's the big difference between a product backlog, which is evolutionary and dynamic, and a traditional development approach of a systems analysis document, which is none of the above. It's monolithic, it's one time only, and it's often at a date before we're even ready to start the next phase of our project. And a key point on all of this is the product owner owns the product backlog. We discussed the need to add non-business stories to ensure that all of the work required to complete the project is included in our backlog, not just the business stories that are for the focus of the product owner. And finally, we discuss the prioritization of the stories and the selection of the stories so that we work on the stories in the next sprint that provide the most value And with that, we conclude this nugget on the product backlog, the single most important artifact in Scrum itself. This concludes our nugget on project vision and product backlog. I hope this module has been informative for you, and thank you very much for viewing.